And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. For God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. 
For God, who spared not his only begotten Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He said, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you would go and bring forth much fruit. Much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. (laughs) For the Lord would say, do not think for a moment within your heart that I have not called, chosen, and elected you. I did not bring you to this generation to be defeated and to be overcome by the enemy. But for such a time as this, I have raised you up. For in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, you will be changed and transformed. And this is not about the taking away of the church, but the bringing forth. I'm about to bring forth my church. without spot or wrinkle or blemish or any such thing. But it will be holy. This will be a work of the Spirit, not the flesh. It will not be man that will claim the glory, but it will be by my Spirit. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither entered in the heart of man those things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For his Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. The mystery is of the kingdom. The mystery of God. Open your Bibles this morning, if you will, to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25. The natural mind, the carnal mind, that which is subject to the flesh and under the control of the flesh, cannot conceive or perceive, cannot understand, cannot comprehend what God is about to do. We are on the other side of a muddy flood. In the days of Noah, Noah kept prophesying. He began to build the ark, they think, about 120 years. He had heard the voice of God. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret to his servants, the prophets. God had given to Noah the promise that I am going to send a flood. In that time, in that generation, it seemed to be bizarre because it had not even rained. The water would come up out of the ground. So Noah built this what they would consider this this bulking ark of a boat from gopher wood, and it was laughed and mocked and ridiculed, for he built it on dry ground. But then it began to rain. And the world was never the same. And even as there was a flood in the natural, we're like Noah's generation, And for Jesus even said, it will be like in the days of Noah. People will be eating and drinking and giving in marriage, buying and selling, but then the flood will come. There is a tsunami of the Holy Ghost about to hit the earth. And if you would have asked that generation just a day before it began to rain, they would have laughed and ridiculed and mocked Noah, but it came just the same. They could not stop what God was about to do, and I want you to know by the Spirit of the Lord that modern-day men, with all of their technology and all their brilliance, will not stop what God is about to do 
upon the earth. You see, that's how God works. It seems like as if God is nowhere to be found. And this has happened many times throughout the history of the human race. For where was God in the days of the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when they were in the land of Egypt? For 400 and some years they were slaves. And even God told Abraham that. Hundreds of years before they ended up in Egypt, the day will come when your descendants will be in Egypt and they will become slaves for 420 years, but I will deliver them. And the Egyptians had no concept of what God was about to do, and I believe with all my heart, neither did the Israelites, for they said, you did things beyond our expectation that we did not even imagine. I'm telling you by the Spirit of God, the Lord is about to show up once again, and he is going to do things that are even beyond our comprehension or even imagination. And when it comes sweeping in, you'll be swept up with it. A mighty move of God. Are you ready for it? And God always does things suddenly, mysteriously, mystically. And actually, I like to just read a couple of scriptures because there's aspects of God that we really, really, really do to understand. And in the old covenant, God's people constantly were crying out, For God to wake up. Now, we're going to talk about the awakening of the church this morning. But yesterday when I was in prayer, a lot of times God will speak to me. He does speak to me and he'll speak to you if you listen. It's hard for him to get through to you when your mind is filled with everything but him. And I heard the word awaken. Awaken. Now, you know, back in 2012, I saw the great awakening. Uh, When God took me to heaven in 1975, uh, I saw the great awakening, and it happened instantly, where nations and kindreds and uh, 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 tongues of all uh, countries came into the kingdom instantly. It was suddenly. Do you ever notice how God does suddenly? And and, and those in the Old Covenant saw this. It, It was like God was asleep. God was nowhere to be found. And when you're asleep, sometimes there are people who sleep so deep, they say this, he's dead to the world. You ever been dead to the world? It seems like at times to you and me that God is dead to the afflictions, to the pains, the sorrows of humanity. And I think that's how it was to, uh, uh, to the uh, Israelites when they were in the, land, in, in the land of Egypt. It's like, God, where are you? What's happening? What's taking place? And, of course, God first revealed himself to a man named Moses. I don't know why, but there are those, even in, when it comes to natural things in society, uh, like the awakening of the locusts. I don't know if you know this, and even the migration of birds, or even uh, when, when the salmon begin to spawn. And, and I've been in Alaska working in, in, in the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the waters of the Bering Sea uh, there in Alaska. And you know what? We could always tell when it was time for the salmon to spawn because there was always one or two or three or four or five or six that would begin to come up the river. And then the Indians knew it was time to get ready to get your nets. I'm telling you, God is beginning to wake up here and there, people, to what his purpose, his plan, and his mission is. And I heard the Lord say to me for the sermon today, this is what I just got. He said, awaken. But in the old covenant, this is what Isaiah the prophet said in Isaiah 51, 9. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake, as in the ancient days, in the generations of old. Art thou not he that hath cut Rahab and wounded the dragon? The prophet's crying out to God, wake up, God, wake up, God, wake up, God. Now, that almost might seem a little bit like blasphemy, but it wasn't at all. How how can you tell when it seems like God is asleep? Because nothing spiritually, per se, is happening. And if you can stop and imagine this, and it's hard for me to wrap my mind around this reality, that God has always been 
always been. Always been. Always. I can't even imagine a million years, let alone a billion. Well, there are a trillion. God has always been. <laughs> always been. God, get a hold of this. God has always been. And yet the history of the human race, and I believe it, is just a little bit over 6,000 years. I don't care what the evolutionists say and the scientists say and all these experts say. I don't care. I'm not impressed with their, with, with their rantings and their ravings. Uh, even our bodies are fearfully and wonderfully made, and they can't explain how it all happens from a little seed and an egg pregnated, microscopic. I don't care what they have to say. But God has always been. And if you would have been in that darkness before Genesis chapter 1, you would have said, God, where are you? But then all of a sudden, God showed up. And God said, let there be. And then God showed up, and the flood came. Then God showed up, and Moses came. Then God showed up, and a little woman, a little young lady by the name of Mary said, let it be according to your word. And then God showed up and the day of Pentecost came. <laughs> I'm telling you what, suddenly God is going to show up in his house. And the Bible says, suddenly he will come to his temple. But it's so climatic because if you look at Christ and his ministry, it was building into a great crescendo. And here he is on, the, on fulfilling a prophetic word on the back of a donkey. He's going into Jerusalem. The people are moved by the Spirit to lay down their coats and their cloaks and to take palm branches. Nobody told them the Spirit of God did it. And they began to shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. To the king. The Pharisees and the religious leaders about lost their mind because they knew that was the fulfilling of the prophetic word of the king, the seed of David, coming to take his kingdom. And so that day you could not have gotten into a much higher place of excitement if you would have been one who was looking for the Messiah. But that, that, that I tell you what, that excitement burst like a balloon. When he was betrayed, it was radical. And the next day, he's hanging on a cross. And it looked like all hope was gone. But what they didn't realize is that that suffering and that pain and that agony was necessary. For Christ could pay the ultimate price for our redemption. Now, stop and think about all that God has done to bring us to this point, this place in history. When I had believed the lie for many years that there was going to be the taking away of the church without another great movement of God. But then the brother of Jesus, his name is James, had divine spiritual insight. And he told the church that was scattered abroad, the 12 tribes, he said, listen, guys. I know it looks bad. You're being persecuted. You're being afflicted. The wealthy are taking advantage of you. They're killing you. They're slaying you. But be patient because this is what's going to happen. The Lord of harvest is patient. <laughs> until, 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 until he receives the early and the latter rain. He said, be also patient. Establish your heart. For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. There is going to be one more shocking Climatic, mind-boggling, heart-gripping, outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Give the Lord a hand clap and a shout. Whew. Whew. Woo. 
and I sense it coming. I sense it. I, 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 I see it. See, you've got to walk by faith. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret to the servants of prophet. Pastor Mike, you preached this for 40, 43 years. I said, I know. I know I've said it. I've seen it. And God took me to heaven. I've seen it in visions and dreams. And I know they were not of my own imagination or making. I'm telling you, God is about to wake up his church. And Jesus told us the very last teaching he did is discovered in Matthew chapter 25. Then shall the kingdom, verse 1, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Yeah, we're the, we're, we're the, we're the bride. Did you know that? The handmaidens of the Lord were his people, washed in his blood. A chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation that should show forth the praises of him that has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And at this moment in history, we're a mess. We're a mess. Filled with unbelief, filled with self desires and, uh, and, 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 and worldly things and don't have time for God, but maybe, maybe just a small remnant. Modern day church using gimmicks and all kinds of tricks and all kinds of foolishness to get people to come together. But those days are about over with. God's going to show up in his house once again. And he ain't going to do what you want him to do. He's going to do what needs to be done. He's going to send the fire and the rain, the wind and the earthquake all at once. What can I do to prepare for it, Pastor Mike? Just cry out for mercy. For when God shows up in all of his glory, all of your plans will be wiped off a chalkboard like an eraser. All of the things you thought you needed and wanted to make you happy will just evaporate like hot water on a wood stove that's heated to where it's burning red. Pastor, how are we going to change people? How many discovered you ain't? How are we going to help people? How many discovered you can't? Only God can. <laughs> See, that's where God wants the, 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 the and, and the ones he's waking up. And there are people waking up. They're waking up. See, when, when Adam and his wife accepted the lie, the lie, they died. And, and actually, Jesus said about Lazarus, he said, he sleepeth. And they said, well, if he's sleeping, that's fine. He said, no, I'm trying to speak it the way I see it, but I'll tell it the way you see it. He's dead. And I'm telling you honestly, if you look at the majority of the modern day church, it is D-E-A-D, -E and it stinks. What is it dead to? It is dead to the book of Acts. It is dead to the miraculous, the supernatural. It is dead to faith. A faith and a confidence that trusts in nobody but God. And Jesus said, when I come back, will there be any faith left on the earth? I mean, oh, that's dramatic. Will there be any faith left on the earth? What kind of faith? A, 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 a divine faith, an aggressive faith, a holy faith, a, 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 a determined faith, a, a persistent faith, a, a, an aggressive faith that causes you to stand on God's word no matter what. And really, to be honest with you, to a great extent, the church is dead to the Word, W-O-R-D. They're dead to the Bible. Oh, they might read it, but they don't believe it. They're dead to truth. And because they're dead to truth, they're dead to holiness. 
They're dead to the fear of the Lord. They're dead to ultimate sacrifice of giving themselves all to the king. They're dead. We're dead. And it says the love of many shall wax cold. They'll be dead because iniquity will abound. That's agape. Agape is dead in the church today to a great extent. But it's okay. Because even when Lazarus was dead, and Jesus said he'll live in their natural mind, they said, Lord, we know he'll live at the last day. He said, no, no, no. Don't you understand? He said, I am the resurrection and the life. <laughs> See, you understand. The resurrection is not a day. It's not even an event. It is a person. His name is Jesus. And you don't think that he, which is the resurrection, can raise the stinky church from its bed of death? He's going he's gonna to raise her up. When he said, Lazarus, come forth, how many months did it take? How many days did it take? How many hours did it take? How many minutes did it take? There is not one person in the midst of that crowd that believed for a moment that Jesus could do what he was about to do, but it didn't matter. For his voice went forth and he said to Lazarus, Come forth! And the power of God raised him from the dead and set him there at the entrance. All that man had to do was roll the stone away, and that's what I'm doing in this sermon. I'm just rolling away the stone. And the next time we hear the voice of Jesus, he won't be saying Lazarus. He'll be speaking your name. <laughs> He'll call you forth out of the death that you've been living with the darkness in your heart towards that which is right and holy and decent. And even as Adam and his wife died to what was right because they believed the lie, death came into this world through one man, so he will bring life into the earth through one man. That's Christ Jesus. And because his voice is going to go forth, I truly believe with all my heart that he's about to speak to you audibly. It could be in your sleep. It could be when you're driving down the road. It could be when you're at work. It could be when you're in the garden. And you could be in the shower. I've heard the audible voice of God close to a, probably a half a dozen times in my life. I've heard his audible voice. It's nothing strange to me. <laughs> I've heard his audible voice. I'm going to hear it once again. And I'm going to hear him say this. Wake up, you sleepy head. <laughs> and you will hear the audible voice of God. And when that voice comes, it will transform you and change you. And all of a sudden, you'll be like a little chick breaking out of its shell. <laughs> You're going to come forth like Lazarus did. When Jesus said, come forth, Lazarus, and he did. Can you give the Lord a hand clap and a shout? Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, didn't take no oil with them. See, there's two churches. There's the harlot church and the holy church. The harlot church... They had the lamp, they had, they had the, the, the look and the feel of believers. But that's all it was, it was tradition. There was no oil. There was no hunger for the movings of the Spirit. I, I pray to God, you're not a part of the harlot church. When the trumpet goes forth, the harlot church... 
it'll be too late for them. But there is a holy church. What's that oil, that hunger for truth, that hunger for God, that hunger? It's like Paul said in Romans chapter 7, Oh, the things I want to do, I can't do. And the things I don't want to do, I do do. Who will deliver me? The harlot church is not crying out for deliverance. The harlot church is happy to live the life they're living. And if they knew that God was coming, that Jesus was going to show up and mess up their plans, they'd beg them not to come. Because they've got their own plans all laid out. But there is, and I'm talking about even prodigal sons and daughters, in the, in the depths of their heart, they're crying out, I want to be free. I want to be free. I want to be free for I can love Jesus. I want to fulfill the first commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, strength, and being. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And the cry of their heart is that cry, Oh God, I want to love you. I want to serve you. I want to follow you. I want to obey you. I, I want to go all the way, Lord. I want to be just like you, Daddy God. That's, that's the real church. But they find themselves asleep. They can't seem to wake up. Now, some of you truck drivers know what I'm talking about. And regular drivers, you're on the road for days, and all of a sudden your body gets tired and your mind wants to shut down. And you know as a truck driver, right, Bill, you dare not go to sleep driving that big old 18-wheeler or maybe a big tour bus. Or you got to slap your face. you gotta, you got to do whatever you can. I know that I used to go on long trips, and I'll be honest, I don't really like driving. And so I, I, my, my, I always had, uh, 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 I had my wife take a, 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 one of these uh, ceramic bags and, and put ice in it with a washcloth. And when I was driving down the road and I'd go to sleep, I'd pull that out and, 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 and squeeze it and wipe that cold water, all that ice. Free. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. You know, spiritually, all of these years, that's what I've been having to do. I've been having to try to wake myself up, stir myself up. I've been trying to keep awake spiritually because I dare not go to sleep at the, at the steering wheel as a pastor. I dare not go to sleep. I dare not go to sleep. I know some of you look at me sometimes like I've lost my mind. I understand. I've got to wake up. I've got to stir up. I've got to, I've got to get up. I, I dare not go to sleep because when I used to pull my, my, my wife and my kids in the fifth wheeler, I knew if I went to sleep, it would be terrible tragedy. And how many preachers have fallen asleep behind the steering wheel? We just look, and you know when you fall asleep, you enter into another world, a make-believe world, right? Where you think everything is all right and everything is okay. I remember one time I was going to do a TV production uh, down in, in, in um, uh, not York, but some city beyond York. It was in Allenstown. And I was driving, I was going down there to do some video recording and the sun was shining on my face. And I, I, I fell asleep without realizing. I fell asleep doing 60 miles an hour on the highway. I fell asleep, and it's like something exploded in me. And I knew I had to uh, wake up. I had to wake up now. And I opened up my eyes, and here my car had gone off into uh, the, 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 the right side of the road. And right in front of me was a bridge going across another highway, pure concrete. And it was right in front of me. And I spun the, 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 the steering wheel. I had a, a Seville Cadillac. I spun it and just almost scratched the side of that concrete uh, 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 wall of that bridge. If I would have kept my eyes closed for just one more second, I would have ate that concrete doing 60 miles an hour. I had to wake up. Tell somebody, you got to wake up. But God's about to awake his church. So these, they all fell asleep. Say, they all fell asleep. They all fell asleep. They all fell asleep. Jesus said this. He said, the kingdom of God is like ten virgins, five foolish and five wise. The five wise had oil. For in other words, they had hunger. They had longing. They had desire. They had ambition. They had something in them that wanted God. But you can meet people in the church today that have no desire for God. 
As a matter of fact, if revival shows up, they'll raise up a group of people to try to shut it down. We just want things the way they have always been. We don't want none of the shouting and the running and the crying and the jumping and the screaming and the rolling. What? What do you mean jumping, shouting, screaming, uh, laughing? Uh, what do you mean? <laughs> Every move of God has these things. And they're not flesh either. Come on, man. You don't think Mary and Martha that day were weeping their eyes out? They don't tell you what happened. But when they, they thought Lazarus was gone, he stunk. It's over with. They thought it's over with. And, and I'll tell you, I know a lot of people probably go past this church and they go, it stinks. <laughs> it's gone. It's over with. But for the last eight months, God's been sending us men here because you know what we're doing? We're rolling the natural stone away from the entrance. <laughs> That's what's going on. We're just rolling the stuff. We're just getting ready. I don't know if you know it's brighter in here. They've been changing the, the ballast and putting up new lights. And I mean, we're getting ready. <laughs> the men that Jesus called to roll away the stone, he didn't care who they were. He didn't say, okay, now we got to have some spiritual men grab a hold of that big old rock door and roll it all away. He just said, roll it away. <laughs> Who knows what kind of men they were. It didn't matter. They rolled it away. I'm telling you, God is rolling away the stone. Well, it's making me happy. <laughs> you figure if a day, if a day was a decade, you know what I'm saying? 35 years I've been here now. God is rolling away the stone. And everybody who was there that day, when Jesus said, roll away the stone, they said, Lord, he stinks. He said, roll away the stone. Nobody, nobody who was there that day expected for Lazarus to ever come back. And this is going to be the shocker because the world looks at the church and says, oh, God might have done that back in the book of Acts. It'll never happen again. Church is dead, and they like it dead. Did you notice most churches have a graveyard? I don't know if that was smart to build, put a graveyard on the property right next to the church, and most churches are like a graveyard just full of dead people. No, I mean, they're dead to praise, they're dead to joy, they're dead to faith, they're dead to life, they're dead to love for God. I mean, they're just plumb dead, deader than a doorknob. Just dead. Lazarus was dead. He looked like he was never coming back. Lord, he, not only was he dead, his, his body was turning putrid. It was. Have you ever had something rotten in your refrigerator? My boys do that all the time. I go in their house and open their refrigerator. I go, whoa, whoa, that stinks, Mike. <laughs> Something's dead in there. You didn't clean that mess out. And the church looks like it's dead. And no natural man, no program could raise it from the dead. Now, I'm sure you could have took that duck dead carcass of, of, of a Lazarus and put some strings on it and put them on the stage and you could have moved that dead corpse around and you could have painted a pretty smile on its face, but it was still dead. And that's what people are trying to do with the church with all kinds of music and shenanigans. We're trying to make the church look like it's alive, but it's not. It's dead. It's dead to holy dead to the power of God and the life of God and the nature of God and the character of God. It's dead. The faith is dead. Jesus said faith without works is dead. Are you hearing me this morning by the Spirit of God? Faith without works is dead. What kind of faith, Pastor Mike? A faith that trusts, a faith that believes, a faith that takes a hold, a faith that says I'm not going nowhere, a faith that says Lord let your will be done. Father, you told me to jump, I'll jump. You told me to praise, I'll praise. You told me that you seek those who will worship you, I'm going to worship you. Lord, I'm going to have a living faith, an active faith, an on fire faith, a God sent faith. And faith is dead in most churches today. But Jesus said, roll away the stone. 
Now they did their part. And then his voice went booming forth with authority and power, dominion. Lazarus! Come forth. And Lazarus came forth. <laughs> Give the Lord a hand clap and a shout. Nobody, listen, listen, I'm telling you right now, not one soul, not one soul that was there that day, even those who had followed Jesus for those three and a half years, because this was close to the time he was, the Passover and when he was going to be betrayed. Not one soul believed that Jesus was going to raise that dead man from the grave. Not one soul, not one soul, but it's okay. Because Jesus called Lazarus forth. There may be very few, would say the Lord, that will believe I'm about to do what I'm about to do. Oh, they doubt within their hearts and their minds that it's possible for my church to come back to life again and to be glorious like it was in the days of old. But did I not say the latter house will be greater than the former, for I'm about to call her forth? And she will come forth in spite of all the doubt within my church, for I will raise her from the dead, would say the Lord. <laughs> you will hear within your heart, within your mind, the sounding of the trumpet that will cause you to become alive. <laughs> It will come forth like a trumpet in the night, for that's what was happening. It was night. These virgins fell asleep. They had a form of godliness, but five denied the power thereof. They saw no need for the all, which is representative of the anointing of God. They saw no need for it. What do we need to carry a container of oil around with us? It's heavy. It's a burden to bear. But there was five of the ten that were smart. They had divine wisdom. And they said, oh, no, we need the moving of the Lord. No, we need the Holy Ghost to come. We need the Spirit to move. We need the anointing and the presence of God. We don't want a dead formalism. We don't want... A church with no life? And they had oil. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. They all slept. And at midnight, say at midnight. That's the darkest time of the day. There was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. I'm telling you, this is the grand finale, the last pouring out of the Spirit. This is the final awakening of the church. It's about to come to the earth. And God is going to do it in a moment, in a twinkling. The voice will go forth, the sounding of the trumpet. And you'll awaken wherever you're at. And what did they do? Listen to this prophetic word that Christ spoke. It was his last bit of teaching. They ran to meet him. Who ran to meet him? The five who had oil in their containers. The voice of the Lord is about to sound. The trumpet's about to blow. Those who want to love and serve and know him, they'll wake up just like the five foolish did. But the five wise virgins that have all in their lamps, that have a cry to serve him, love him, know him, walk with him, become one with him, rule and reign with him, to experience him, guess what we're going to be doing? We're going to be running towards them. We're going to run towards God. And it says in the book of James, draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. The church is about to run to her bridegroom. You got your BFI shoes on? You all ready to run towards the king? 
at the sounding of the trumpet, they all woke up. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. For in other words, we don't have hunger for God. We don't really care about God. We're, we're just doing this. We don't know how, why we're doing this. Think about this. I was involved, in, and, and I'm not saying all oh, were like this. My, church, my, my family was highly involved in, in religious activities. And I can tell you honestly, none of us had love for Jesus. Oh, man, we, and it doesn't matter what denomination you are, but we, we had the traditions down, Pat. I mean, I could confess my sins to the priest. I could splash the holy water, and it doesn't matter if you're Lutheran, Presbyterian, Baptist, Assembly of God, or Church of God. It, you, just, you learn your religious things, but it's, there's no conviction in your heart. There's no hunger in your heart. It's this empty, empty traditions, and I had them, and none of us had love for God until God got a hold of me. <laughs> And I'm telling you, from that moment to this, there has been a hunger. There has been a thirst. There has been a longing. I've never lost it. I've never lost that hunger for God. Oh, there's been times that the devil caused me to go to sleep just like these people did. But I'm telling you what, the trumpet's going to sound. And those who want to know him will know him. They will know him in his power and his glory. Some of you have said within your heart, Lord, I don't even know why I'm still here. I'm going to tell you why you're still here. Because God wants you here in a final outpouring. And some of you hang them by just a, a thread to your sanity. He is saying, how am I holding on, God? Because there is within your heart this knowledge. God is about to do something. And nobody will expect it. You probably don't even expect it, but it will happen. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise hand says, Not so, man, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom, what? Came. There'll be people in the religious, traditional churches. They'll be trying to stir themselves up. They'll be trying to get hunger for God. They'll be trying to make their heart go after Jesus. It'll be too late. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the doors were shut. The doors were shut. What does that mean, Pastor Mike? It was like in the days of Noah, when Noah and his family got into the ark. See, I'm convinced. God said, come on in, come on in. He told Noah, come on in, come on in. And then God shut the doors. And when I went to hell, I'm telling you, every soul I ran into in hell bumped into heard screaming. You know what they were all screaming? God, give me another chance. Give me another chance. And then they would curse God again. And they'd, take, they'd be taken away in the, the angry, churning, bubbling lavas of eternal darkness and fire. It was too late for them. And the day will come when God calls forth his church. And we will run to meet them. Those of us who wanted to have a hunger. Let me ask you, people scare me in the church today. I'm telling you honestly. I run into believers all over the place. And you begin to talk about spiritual realities and truths and divine revelations and healings and miracles. And they look at you like zombies, like their eyes are glazed over. And it's like, and you all know religious people. We're not judging our hearts to condemn them, but don't your hearts tremble for them. I know backslidden Christians who have way more hunger than some of those who sit in the pews of their churches every Sunday. I've seen more hunger in some of these prisoners coming here than I've seen in people who say they know Jesus. Because you begin to engage them. Don't they ask us for prayer, Pete? Don't they draw it out of us? Aren't they crying out for deliverance? But they feel like they're Lazarus. They're dead. There's no hope for them. But there's great hope. For the trumpet's about to sound. And the voice of the bridegroom is going to be heard. And the bride is going to run to meet him. Give the Lord a hand clap and a shout.
so we'll stop there. There's so much more I'll share it with you tonight. What do I do right now, Pastor Mike, until I hear the voice of, this, uh, of the bridegroom and you hear the voice, the sounding of the trumpet? Well, don't, don't just sit back and say, okay, well, Pastor Mike said the day will come when I wake up. No, start stirring yourself up now. Start preparing your heart now. Lest you be one of those with no oil in your lamp. Man, don't have this attitude. Well, I'll get the oil when I need it. You won't get it then. You gotta, you gotta have some kind of stirring, some kind of moving, some kind of unction, some kind of desire in your heart right now. And Paul told Timothy, stir up the gift that is in you. How, Pastor? Pray. I, I wrote. A, I just wrote a new book. Why do you think I write these books? Not because you need them in a sense that you got your Bible, but God's given the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and preacher. And I wanted to stir myself up this earlier in the year to pray. And I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, why, why, why do I need to pray? And He began to show me, and He gave me twenty reasons why I need to pray. Can you even stir yourself up enough to read books, watch sermons, listen to teachings, lest you find your vessel with no oil? Get some oil. Dave, I want to share this story. Dave, the other day, Pete and I was in the lunchroom, and Dave staying on a property, and Dave came in, and I looked at him, I could tell there was a change. He was teary-eyed. Real quiet. I said, what's going on, Dave? And he had gotten the one book of meditation, my daily meditations. It's the scripture. And he said, Pastor Mike, I, I, I've been reading scriptures. Probably a lot of them have never read them before. He said, that's right. And there was a stirring in his heart. He's been over here crying. That's okay, Dave. I cry all the time. Why would a grown man cry? Because God is stirring his heart. God is stirring his heart. People we think that will never make it are going to be the ones like me who make it. Nobody's and nothings. I'm a failure. I'm a flop. I was a mess before I got born again, and I'm still a mess without Jesus. You got to stir yourself up, man. I've been preaching. I, I'm not saying you got to have tears in your eyes, but I've been watching you all wipe the tears away from your eyes this morning. I know what's going on. God is stirring you. God is getting ready. The trumpet's about to blow.